Please welcome Michael. Give him a So thank you for having me, um, and thanks for the uh, for this great conference and really the ability for really hosting the AI community in Munich. Um, so it's really great to pleasure to talk to you about what we're actually doing at the Fargo. So before I start um, with giving you more um, information about the topic of conversation with AI, I just want to start with a let's say a, a personal story um, I experienced really when I when I just graduated from from university. So when I was graduating from the university, we had the chance to um, to really visit the IBM research laboratories uh, in Stuttgart, and they was a kind to host us a whole day and really showcase some of the let's say state of the art technology of that day. So um, we saw something about actually how applying uh, video conferences. We were talking about wearables. We we're talking about location-based services, and we we're talking also about voice they showed us how voice could control um, could control um, devices so but when I left uh, this uh, this day or left from IBM this day I was really not really thrilled so um, they showcased everything some good they were really all PhDs researchers and they done a really incredible job but the problem was that I was really thinking in this kind of um, devices so that was 2000 actually and when we're talking about location-based services or voice control systems, so it doesn't it didn't make sense at that time. So at that time, you had these telephones. Um, they were actually not connected to the web. They had monochrome displays. They had T9 uh, interfaces. So that was actually not something that you can envision that really this is the future of really where you interact um, with the world. So, but then, only seven years later, this happens. And this was really a revolutionary breakthrough in how we interface with, or how we interact with devices, actually. Um, even if this device couldn't send out SMS, it was way ahead of its time. It had internet connectivity, slower, yeah, but still. Um, it had sensors in it, and it had a new way to really interface it. There was no voice control here yet, but it was really something we can really experience how new technology is really transforming really an industry. You know? And Nokia, the uh, company I showcased you earlier, is not really existing anymore in the end user space. They're doing well in network operations still, but not in the end user space. So fast forwarding to today, um, more than 10 years later, we have these incredibly powerful devices. So, and these devices really enable us to build new kind of products, new kind of systems that are yet really to be uh, invented. So the main point I want to make in this story is that from my perspective and from the perspective of the company I'm working for, um, that we're really experiencing a fundamental shift in how we will interact with these devices. Um, I will give you more about how we see conversations and what is in and what is out from our point of view. And I give you more information about in this talk really how we see that conversation and voice is actually changing the game. Just a quick um, information about myself. My name is Michael. I'm the CTO of a startup in Munich called Fineway. So it's actually a travel tech startup working in the AI space. Um, we're working with a small team of experts really on providing users with a trip planning service that uses AI in conversation really to make um, highly personalized trips. And I will talk about this service and how we see it as an assistant technology um, too. So how does that actually link this talk to the topic of AI? Sure, if we talk about voice, we have natural language understanding and deep learning, but this is actually a, a section from an article just recently posted by Michael John, a um, professor of machine learning in Berkeley, California, and he said, okay, the AI revolution isn't here yet. But what he said, where we should really focus on as practitioners in this field, are two, um, two topics. First is intelligent infrastructure, that's not the point of this talk, but what it actually does is really making um, the interconnection of things much more clever by using data to really um, yeah, to really provide this, this web of computation. The more interesting thing um, from, from our perspective, from my perspective, is really the intelligence uh, augmentation, where we really use computing power to enhance the creativity uh, and assist humans in really making decisions. So these are 
from the, let's say, from someone who is really deep in the field, a machine learning and AI practitioner, who really sees the kind of, um, the kind of trends and the kind of applications. And it's the second point that we're talking about today, really that augmenting users by using conversational services or digital systems. So what's driving this, um, this revolutionary shift, as I, um, as I highlighted earlier in the slide, is actually different kind of topics. One is personalization. So when you're building a user-oriented um, user, um, product for uh, B2C customers, they actually expect that this is a product. Mostly they expect it to be free of charge, but they want it to be for them uh, really personalized. So we're talking about this audience of one. So um, the Netflix you're using, for instance, is should be your Netflix. Yeah, it's the same technology, but what actually matters is the content, the personalized content. The next trend: intelligent devices. I talked about it um, currently. So the devices actually have the ability to sense into the world, to be always connected, to have the power to um, to run sophisticated models on the device. Um, and this is actually a major source. And artificial intelligence, that's why we're here today, um, that's actually where things now, what we see, are really coming from the theoretical world into the product world. So where we really have applied um, machine learning um, as, one, um, let's say, as one instance of, of AI where we can use that today readily to really build products. Um, and the last one is actually voice-based interfaces. So while the first three are actually, everybody or most people would agree that this is actually here, just want to give you more information about um, why voice is considering uh, or considered to be a, a growing factor in, in how we interact with devices. So the main point of this slide is actually that right now, uh, and think about what I told this personal story, so we are in the early stages of, um, of voice. So we are, let's say, where the global voice searches, one billion um, searches, are actually rather low. Why we took voice searches is actually where um, companies publish a lot. Um, this is actually numbers we, um, we derived from research, um, but there's also um, a lot of practitioners, um, for instance, um, from, from Baidu, who say that voice in general become the prevalent uh, form of interacting with the voice, uh, devices. But read to see if it's 50% or only 25%, let's see. But this is actually a proxy metric about how you will see that future generations or people in the near future will actually interface um, with uh, devices. And that's why this chart is actually why um, all the big companies um, are betting on, on voice, the Google, um, be it uh, Amazon, but also Facebook. So before we, um, I tell you something about how we actually, um, we're using uh, conversational AI, I just want to give you some, let's say, common um, examples of where you can use conversations, where you can use artificial intelligence to actually build a system. So that's actually the topic of this talk, really digital systems, AI-based systems. The first one to start with, it's actually um, XAI. It's an artificial intelligence powered service where you can take Amy or Andrew, these are the, the email address you see here, you add them to the point of the conversation and really ask her or him to really schedule a meeting for you with the one who is participating in the conversation as well. If you want to move to a different, uh, to a different timeline, maybe your, um, your flight back home is being rescheduled, you need to stay a lot earlier on a, business, uh, uh, a bit more on a business trip, then this uh, AI system can happen well. So this is something about how we use conversation as email, for instance, to, um, to interface with the user. The next one, um, a German company, also very interesting, was a startup from Berlin, Ada Health. So Ada Health is actually a health companion app. What are they actually doing? They use a conversational type of approach for medical diagnosis. So you are actually starting a conversation um, about your, your symptoms and they derive a, um, they try to figure out what kind of illness you may have, how fatal it is, if you actually need to attend a doctor soon. So um, this is actually um, a, a kind of service which is retargeting really the healthcare market where AI maybe it's not the 
the prevailing methodology to use by really formulating expert knowledge. But still, this is more about how you interface with it via a chat-like interface or bot-like interface. Who of you had actually watched the Google, Google Duplex uh, presentation of Google I.O.? Okay, um, most of all, um, for the others, you definitely need to check it out. What is Google Duplex? What they actually showed, Google Duplex is the technology behind it, is actually having an AI service call in a restaurant or call in a, um, a hairdresser saloon to really make an appointment. So it's a computer giving a task to schedule an appointment and talking to a real human. It was so good that actually most of the conversation in, in media was about how scary it was and that we need to regulate that kind of technology. But that's super, super impressive what they did and how you can actually make it work. Um, and something um, most of you may also have heard about it, um, Project M, a very ambitious uh, project by Facebook, Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg, um, I don't know if it's a true story, but um, he liked the idea of Jarvis, the, the AI of Tony Stark and Iron Man that much that he wanted to build something himself. And that's actually what they tried to do. So the interesting approach to this problem was that they set up a, um, a team of human operators, concierge service people, who are actually you could call and they would observe all the communication. So they were giving them the information about what tasks to use and they really observed humans about how the humans would uh, try to approach that problem. So the, the problem of being was very broad. Uh, Facebook said they learned a lot from it, but they discontinued it um, this year. I think it's um, everybody agrees building something is, um, is really like a moonshot um, project by itself. But I think uh, Facebook got, got a lot of information out of it. So how does that actually then compare that kind of uh, technology? So we have different interfaces from uh, email to a bot-like interface to, uh, to voice. So uh, in terms of sophistication um, of, the, um, of this conversational service or this digital assistant, you can differentiate between three types. One is simple bot. Could be the bot you're using, like um, many companies are using it right now to have a um, an interface for the FAQ. It looks like um, it's it's very clever, but it actually does intent mapping and provides you another interface uh, like search. Um, that really helps a lot. People are um, or companies are saving millions for that. If you think about an airline company, all the people are calling in um, or um, spending time on the side. Really, um, what is my baggage allowance? Yeah, that can actually help. That's only more than general access. The next thing is the task-oriented dialogue actions, um, agents. What I ex uh, showcased you um, here, these are more than they are focused on a specific niche. They are not artificial general intelligence, so they are more focused on really performing one task. And on the right side is one thing which we call cross-domain agents. Cross-domain agents are those tasks like uh, project M, which are actually meant to comprise a whole level, um, a whole um, breadth of tasks. Um, so that would really be, let's say, more the traditional sense of AI as the main knowledge system for a general purpose um, problem solving. Okay, just quickly, um, I highlighted it when you want to build something like that. So what can you actually do about it? So these digital um, assistant technologies, um, can be a traditional web um, application or a, a native application. Um, we will launch in about one or two weeks um, our first uh, assistant uh, for travel planning on Google Alexa. So voice is also coming coming really online. But you have really a breadth of other technologies. And not to forget Bixby by Samsung, um, Samsung being one of the uh, biggest companies in the world with a huge uh, number of uh, devices, not only telephones, but also um, TVs, are really also the source of, of interaction in the future. And on the other hand, you have the, the messengers, um, mostly in, in Western world, uh, Facebook, but then in, in China, everything is sent via, via WeChat. So that's um, the things that we have right now. What is upcoming in the future? Um, we don't know. I think it's mostly that it will be a combination of those different services. 
And we saw, see that there are also um, third-party vendors coming up that provide you that technology to have, really have a conversation with the user so that you can really use it in your app or maybe in, in the messenger. So things will be blurry. So currently everyone is, um, is really focusing um, like the operating systems um, on providing this wallet garden to have only their uh, apps allowed on their platforms. But that's actually what we see is blurry. Okay. What are we actually doing? So why have we have competence in actually using conversation? So Bindway, as I said, is a startup um, that's focused. And, and I see, you know, the, the problem that you, you have when you you have the, the PowerPoint on uh, on Mac, it's, it's let's say, 95% the same as the one on, on Windows, uh, except this one. <laughs> uh, next time I will do the PDF version. But never mind. So um, what we're actually doing is we're providing um, a free trip planning service. So what we actually, where we're coming from, so the company was built as an online tour operator. Um, so we design travels and book travels with customers. But what we're actually building um, as, a, as a tech company is really a service where you can really have a conversation with our service to really get fully personalized trip recommendations. How does it work? So. Um, Usually you start with what we call the travel intent. Now let's think about you, you maybe you want to go to South Africa or you want to visit some other place in the world you've never been there. So I'm currently planning a trip to China. I've not been there and really researching about what to do in China is it's kind of hard. Maybe if you've been there once or have someone you know, um, much easier, but that's more of, of the travel intent. So what we do in the, in the next step is really, we have a conversation engine that's actually asking you 10 questions and this is a fully dynamic um, question and answer mechanism um, to really get the intent out of it, to really at the third step provide you with, um, with a um, really completely bookable and free trip plan that you can use in QWeek and then you can book it by us or you can, can explore it. That's what we're building uh, currently. How does that look? So actually this is the German version of it. But you see, this is the kind of interface um, that we choose really to, to implement. Um, it's a kind of a chatbot interface, but in a very structured way. We found out, so we also had a messenger or a traditional chat type interface, but we found out that it's way too complex for, for customers to, um, to type in their intent. So our actually, um, the, the technology we're using, our bank um, business competence or the knowledge expertise we bring in there, is actually about asking the right kind of questions that move us forward in understanding what the user needs in terms of the recommendation we will serve. So you see two on, on the left and in the middle, two type of, of um, questions we want to ask, um, where we want to get some, some answers from the user, and the third one you get, the, you get this result. So how do we actually do this? Um, very briefly, we have this conversation engine, which is actually driven by data we get from um, which we call signals from the outside, from different kind of interface. So the service is completely agnostic to actually how you use it. Could be chat, could be voice, um, or, or this voice, um, or the spotlight interface. And we then generate the, the, um, the trip proposal, which you can then adapt as a option. So it's, it's, it's a very, very high level view. But again, like all digital and AI or products, it's really about collecting signals from the users. That's what the, the errors actually mean. So we have user-specific signals, we have aggregated signals, you have context from the user visiting your page even before. So that's actually the kind of information we take to, let's say, to, to um, get prior knowledge about the situation, about the context of the user to really kickstart the conversation. So why are conversations then better than what most uh, people use today? Um, so the traditional approach, and I'm coming from the from the media industry, I have an um, advertisement uh, background uh, there. Um, what you usually do, you um, generate a large number of click streams, usually gigabytes per day, and then you do um, different machine learning algorithms, like clustering, you feed in expert knowledge, or panel data, social demographic data into it, and outcomes um, outcomes this kind of user profile. But the problem with this approach is that when you want to understand the user, maybe you want to get his gender or income bucket or maybe some, some preferences, you need really, really a lot of data. So this is, clickstream data is shallow data from, from my perspective, really shallow signal. 
um, while the conversational approach is very different to that. So in the conversational approach, it's not about collecting a lot of different data. Um, actually, we do this um, as well. But um, in, the, in the conversational sense, what is the actual challenge is asking the right questions. And this is where business knowledge, prior knowledge comes actually into play. So when we actually want to see if someone traveling with a family, we will detect this, um, or we can simply ask him, um, and really get this information out of him. The good thing is, if you're, in the, if you're planning a trip, people are much more likely to, um, to really accept that you're using the data for personalization. So if you can showcase people or show people what actually the, um, the main outcome of your product is, it's much easier for them to really accept that they, they give you that kind of information. And still, this is anonymized information, still that we're processing. So the conversations, I think every conversation engine that you would build um, has this, let's say, kind of simple function you would definitely require prior knowledge. So um, if you um, think of any conversation you have with someone, so there must be something where um, explicit business knowledge or explicit knowledge about the situation at hand is actually with a conversation partner. Otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you can do small talk, yeah, but still you want to learn something. So there's really some sense of, of this prior knowledge you get, uh, you need to feed into your system. This is where the traditional AI part really comes, we learn something, so we have also really what we call travel assistants, people who have lived in these countries, really to, to tell us what is actually the right kind of prior information to kickstart the information. Then you have context, um, so this is very important, we humans really don't forget things in the conversation, actually we build up on it, so you need to have machine learning models that actually are capable of um, of storing um, contextual information and advanced that information. And then you have this, what I call implicit and explicit signals, things that you learn really along the way from the user via only observing, observing things, or you generate um, explicit data while um, really providing interaction points with him. Either asking a question that he gives an answer, or that you, um, that you, um, actually interact or observe interactions with partners. Uh, does it like the proposal? Does it share with That's a that's a basic um, uh, the the basic formula really to drive this. So what happens if you don't have context? And actually, everybody who's using Siri knows that uh, context is not the strongest point of Apple. So Google Home is much better than that. So this was actually a um, printed on. The, um, the handout bags for a conference, the chatbot conference, and it really shows, so if you don't really understand the context, if you don't have context information, um, that means that it's not a, not a natural, um, not a like natural conversation you have with the user. So that's actually when you forget about what you're talking to, when the consumer or the user always need to restate things, that's not working. So how are we actually doing it? It's actually part of the, um, of, of the company presentation and um, I would really love to spend uh, another uh, half an hour really to talk more in depth about um, how you can actually do this, how we, how we do this. You can, um, or we actually apply um, many of these uh, algorithms. So we're not applying neural networks and matrix factorization yet. Uh, we know when to apply, but the, the thing is that we are still in the learning phase and these methods have huge capacity in the models that require a lot of data to be trained. Actually, we're using natural language for um, indirectly with Alexa, but um, all the other um, all the other mechanisms are really um, tailored to specific areas about how you actually can build that uh, information about progressing um, by learning the user intent um, to get uh, context um, context information and match it to the user intent. So, to sum it up, why should we care? Um, I hope, so this was more a product talk. Should we need more this, what are we actually building as machine learning or AI practitioners? So we are building technology, the technology is very useful, but um, the technology really needs a, a large adoption. And um, why should our customers care? So um, actually what we, what we have um, written down is three points. 
is the rise of voice-based interfaces. So voice will be the prevailing um, platform um, of choice. If you interact with, with Alexa today, um, rest assured that uh, Amazon is spending billions really on improving that technology. Um, and I think also Apple will come up with something better than Siri. Um, but if you really right now try to use Google Home to book a flight to a destination, you can do this by interacting only with your with your smartphone. So um, this is really really capable um, of, of really handling this and, uh, that um, situation very well. Um, the next thing, digital assistants have arrived. I hope that I can uh, show you some examples where this is not some some kind of rocket science technology that will be invented in a couple of years. It's actually invented right now. So some smaller companies are already claiming that field for them. Um, it's the same as with the apps on the on the iOS. There will be some apps who will be first, who will stick. Uh, so it's really a, also a first mover um, advantage. And the next uh, last thing is really that conversational AI really changes the way how we interact with these devices by really having natural conversations um, with this technology. So, um, this is the last slide. Um, I mentioned that, that we are hiring. Yeah? I, I really didn't want to put it on, on the slide, it would be too obvious. But it's actually um, what, uh, what our motto um, is, what our company vision is, that we really make um, planning really complex trips to something we have not before incredibly easy. That's what we are um, working right now on. This is what we will launch um, very, very soon. And yeah, I was happy really to, to have you for this talk. Hope you enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> Any questions? No, um, uh, it's not. Um, it's a very good question. Obviously, um, I'm just coming from an investor meeting today, so they, I've been asked this uh, quite, a lot, uh, quite a lot. Actually, this, so we, um, Fineway has the, the advantage of really having built up an online tool operating business, so we can monetize the trips uh, and yourself. But we also provide affiliate, affiliate model, which is very traditional in the travel industry, like always. Um, we really um, get um, um, get money out of converting, let's say, a larger number of traffic into a little amount of, of bookings. So that's actually the digital economy, um, like Amazon everybody has. That. So yes, you only focus on booking flights, travels. You only focus on travels and bookings. So we don't actually we don't focus on booking. All right. So what we're actually building. So the company has focused on booking um, trips um, for the last three years. But actually, what we are building now, and this is not available yet. So we have a travel pod already available as a showcase and as a demo where we learn actually from for South Africa. Um, but we are not about booking. So this is more a transparent service where we really provides the complete what they call it itinerary. Um, of the trip and with affiliate links where you can book it um, uh, either via us, via um, our affiliate partner. So that's actually the, the business model. It's like um, so Amazon, Amazon only needs to convert, let's say, a given share of the total traffic. Others are using it maybe only for checking the, the social recommendations or the, the social um, score for a product. So that's actually how we got this business model. And another question, how long it will take you to switch to another domain if I want something for my shop online shop? So we have actually so what we're what we're building is so this technology is kind of agnostic. Uh, but um, what you see, so we could switch easily, I would say. What would be hard to do would really um, having that prior knowledge. So this is not something so most of when when we talk about machine learning. People consider this as end-to-end -end learning problems, and you actually cannot do this. Travel is so complex, it's, um, it's let's say, so old, um, that you're not able really to do end-to-end -end learning. So you need to have really prior expert knowledge, you need to, uh, um, you need to have within your, within your models, and that's actually the hard part, getting that, um, formulating that, and this is, um, this is actually what will, will take um, longer than actually switching the technology. It's also the, it's what they usually, Call the um, the hurdle for uh, for copying that kind of business model because it's only about having business knowledge. 
Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank, Thank you. you. We would like to thank all the sponsors and participants and the speakers for attending MI Summit, the one and only free event in Munich regarding artificial intelligence. It will become even bigger for the next years because we believe that the science should be heaped free.